And we are live. Greetings <laughs> and salutations. We have a saying here, Jenna, on the World Anvil podcast. It's not a World Anvil stream without some audio issues. How are you doing, Jenna? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Very I know good. at first I saw your mouth moving and I was like, oh no, I cannot hear you. <laughs> That's well, how we now. know something has gone wrong. <laughs> Well, folks, we are so excited today to have Jenna Moresi here to talk to us about writing, uh, world building, marketing our books, all that jazz. Um, Jenna, are you well? Are you hyped to talk to us about writing? I am. I am very well. I'm very hyped. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It is a huge honor. It is our honor. Absolutely. Now, um, our topic this month is pretty much anything goes we do not have a challenge running right now but of course we have summer camp coming up that is a fantastic chance to do some world building some writing do some cool stuff so if you want to take part in that go to worldanvil.com forward slash summer camp yes and uh, you will find out more about that and what it is but in the meantime let me introduce jenna possibly pro possibly Possibly, <laughs> definitely, <laughs> indubitably. Here we go. My guest today is the outstanding Jenna Moresi, who is a full-time, best-selling, glorious, fantastic author, YouTube star, and cyborg. Her um, book series include the dark fantasy series The Savior's Champion, and her YA sci-fi novel Eve the Awakening. Is that everything? Did I get everything? Yes, and then um, the uh, book that I have coming out next is The Savior Sister, which oh, yeah. is the second book in the Savior series. So yes, yeah, 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 about that. Yeah. You can learn more <laughs> about both of those books and Jenna herself on jennamoresi.com. And she is also, also an expert in self-publishing. So you can find her <laughs> courses on Skillshare. I am going to put a great big copy pasta in the chat where you can find everything, including including, which Jenna just shared with me, a little teaser for The Savior's Sister. Tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, The Savior's Champion follows a character named Tobias, his journey uh, throughout uh, the Sovereign's Tournament, which is this month-long gladiatorial-style tournament um, where the man who's left standing gets to marry the Holy Queen <gasps> of their realm. And... Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> through the Savior's Champion, you learn that things are not quite what they seem, and um, he ends up falling for the wrong woman. Uh, Sa the Savior's Sister is a companion novel to that. We follow Layla, Tobias's love interest, um, and you 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 get to see the other side of the coin. You get to see all of the political intrigue, uh, the manipulation. It's uh, the Savior's Champion is much more blood and guts. The Savior's Sister, still some blood and guts, um, but it's a lot of uh, kind of like a game of chess and you see uh, the Senate, you see um, all of the treachery that's going on behind the scenes um, sure. in the Palace of Thessin. And there's, so there's a, a lot of bombshell. Like, cerebral <laughs> plotting, we're expecting mm -hmm. backstabbing. I the yeah. March style backstabbing you know. and front stabbing. Backstabbing and, and front stabbing. If you go stab <laughs> stab any which way, that's always been my yes. motto. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> it's been really, really, really fun to tell uh, her side of the story, and it's very important for the rest of the series because you kind of need to know the political agenda moving forward. So it's been it's been an absolute blast, and I can't wait for it to be live. Very cool. Samuel Robbins says, okay, I'm reading this. Lots of interest in the chat for that. So guys, if you want to check that out, I've just dropped the links where you can see a little bit more about that. And uh, make sure you read The Savior's Champion so you're ready for The Savior's Sister when it comes out. I think it's also an audiobook, isn't it? Yes, it is. The Savior's wait, Champion wait, wait. is on audiobook. I love my narrator. Oh my gosh. Not, uh, it's nice to work with someone who not only is really good at their job, but is just like the nicest person in the whole world. Nick Denton. If any of you guys are writers and need an audiobook narrator, I highly recommend him. Ooh. He is wonderful. Good recommend. <laughs> I'm just looking up uh, how to turn off those notifications, folks. I'm sorry. I know they're a little bit irritating. Uh, Demetrius, if you can send me a very quick how-to that I can follow very subtly <laughs> as we are on stream. Tip number one of show business, make everything look easy. Yes, yes, doing that. But I think it's time to get into our interview. Let's start, since we've been talking about your books and your trilogy, where do you start a new series or a new, or a new book in a series? Like, are you a pantser or a plotter? 
I am definitely a plotter. I am a hardcore plotter. Um, I I write. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> I write the most detailed outlines of anyone I know. I think um, I'm currently working on the third book in a series. It's actually going to be four or more books, um, but I'm currently working on the third book. And I think my outline is about 30 pages long. Uh, and that's because I, I dump any ideas that I have in there, even if they're streams of dialogue, if they're whole conversations, I will dump it in the outline. Um, so I always, I, I usually start with a very simple, basic plot idea and then the basic idea of the main characters. So it's usually um, the hero or heroine, the love interest, and the villain. And then from there, I add the details, I build. Um, I uh, All of my stories tend to be very long and have lots of moving parts, lots of subplots. So I put all of my ideas onto note cards and I have like a big whiteboard and I move them around to find the chronological order. And once I have that, that's when I start building the actual very detailed outline that's 30 plus pages long and would very give cool. most people an aneurysm. Over to be philosophy. fair, <laughs> to be fair, I don't know if you read Stephen King's A Memoir, but 30 pages is pretty much the length that his novels seem to start, and then he drafts and drafts and builds and builds, right? So it's just, it's different strokes for different folks, do you know what I mean? It's, you don't write long mm -hmm. outlines, you write short first drafts. That's what you do. <laughs> there we go, I That's like what that. You do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. I'm going to say that from now on anytime because sometimes because I'll, I'll have outline videos on my channel and pantsers get really mad and I'm like, I'm not telling you, you have to outline. I'm just saying this works for me and it works for a lot of people. Um, so next time they get angry, I'll just be like, I, I'm a pantser too, guys. It's just that my, uh, my first draft is in bullet points. <laughs> there right. you go. Exactly. Exactly. And you know what? Like we say, this is the plotting phase and this is the writing phase, but do you know what? It's like genre. It's like, I have this video on the three types of world building and people ask me, can you mix them? Yes, of course. Of course you can mix genre. Of course you can mix these stages. These are, right. these are guidelines to conceptualize. They are not rules, right? So right, exactly. Even, exactly. So even if you're a plotter, you can still pants. Even if you're a pantser, you can still plot. Yeah. We, we can be you chill, do. guys. That's, that's where we're at. <laughs> right. So what right. does the whole process look like? How many drafts do you see? Obviously you have draft one, which is in bullet points, and then... <laughs> Well, um, it's really hard for me to answer that because I edit as I go, which is not usually recommended. Um, but you know, do you different, different strokes, different folks. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, I edit as I go. So by the time that I finish my, you know, first draft, it's really more like a 10th draft because I've gone through it so many times. They, well, it's, it's usually more than the 10th draft. But basically what I do is I will spend my day writing. I will not look back. I will not read anything I've written. And it's very frustrating because I know, like you can feel the garbage leaving your fingertips while you're typing on the keyboard. You're like, this is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, this is bad. I know it's bad, but I'm not gonna read it because I'm gonna get stuck in my head. So I just write it, write it, write it. And then the next day when I go to write again, the first thing I do is, and it has to be the next day. It's never the same day. The next day I go back and with fresh eyes, I read everything that I've written the previous day and I fix it. Anything that's like, I know I can fix this right now, I fix it. If it's something that I know is messed up, but I don't know how to fix it, I just highlight it and move on. I'm like, Future Jenna will work on that. So I do that and then I continue writing more. And that is the process that I do until I finish the chapter. Once the chapter is over, I take a day to edit the entire chapter again. Sometimes the highlighted parts um, have, you know, I, I've suddenly come up with an epiphany and I don't know how to fix them. Sometimes I realize, wow, there's way more crap in this, you know, uh, chapter than I thought. This whole thing needs a rewrite. And um, I work on it and then I move on. And that's my process for the, essentially the first draft. So it takes me longer than the average person to finish a first draft, but the bright side is that when it comes to the second draft and the third draft, it is significantly quicker for me because I've already done a lot of the heavy labor. And um, so people will be like, wow, your editing process is a lot faster than mine. And I'm like, it's it's not because I'm better. It is just because I do the first draft differently. And it's it all depends on what works for you. There are a lot of people who, if they did my method, they would never finish a book. So don't do my method, do what works for you. 
I think that's um, that's a really crucial thing just to put out there as we go forward in this podcast because every writer is different, every book is different. I've written books that needed different processes, and I'm I'm sure that you found that from project to project. Sometimes the process is just a little bit different because the book is a little bit different. So right. at the end of the day, folks, we are throwing out ideas, we are throwing out our own processes, but you have to do what works for you and feel free to try and feel free to bin if it is not working, right? Exactly. Like for me, I, I, the first thing I tried was what everyone recommends, which is that you just write it straight through and don't edit anything. That was giving me so much anxiety because I was so hyper aware of all of the mistakes that I knew that I could just really quickly fix. And um, I, it, it, it actually slowed down my progress because I could not move forward knowing that there were all these mistakes and it was, it was slowing me down. So I ended up having to go with the edit as I write process, which most people don't recommend because they say that it will slow you down and prevent you from finishing. Whereas the popular method for me was slowing me down and preventing me from finishing. So it really just depends on the person. You just, you gotta do what works for you. Yeah, absolutely. And it depends when you're writing, like if you're trying to write a NaNoWriMo project, you're never going to finish if you keep editing. <laughs> unless unless you have a lot of time, it is a more time consuming process to get out that first 50,000 words to finish NaNoWriMo. So, you know, pick your, pick your battles. So you do about exactly. 10 drafts or so. <laughs> and then what happens? Sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so after I go through uh, the drafting process, um, once I have the story in a in a position where I feel like this is as good as I can get it by myself on my own, then I submit it to beta readers. I am very methodical with my beta reader process. I won't have any less than 20 beta readers because I have a finance background. I'm into math and stuff like that. And I like stats and numbers. And I like to look for trends and the feedback. And I have a what I call the rule of three, which is if three or more uh, betas point out an issue, the exact same issue, nine times out of 10, it becomes a recurring thing. So once three betas say, I have a problem with X, Y, Z, nine times out of 10, it, more betas keep saying it. So three is the magic number for me. If three people say it, I fix it. Um, if Even if only one person says it, but right away I'm like, oh yeah, they're right, I'll, obviously I'll fix it. But if I'm unsure about a piece of feedback, once three people say it, I'm like, okay, this is a problem, I need to fix it. So the beta reader process is the next step for me. Um, I usually do it in phases of 10 betas. Um, so I will send it out to 10 betas, I will make the corrections that they suggest, and then I will send it out to 10 more betas, make the corrections they suggest, and I do this process over and over again until I get to a beta process where 95% of the feedback is positive and the critiques that they do have are things that are gonna get fixed in the, the professional edit. You know, things like, oh, there are comma mistakes or the adverbs, things like that. So I go through the beta process. Oh, I forgot, totally skipped. I do the critique process as well with critique partners, but that's usually happening while I'm drafting. Um, so they're usually the first people to see it. Then it's the beta readers. Um, and after the beta readers, once I've, once I've uh, you know, polished it up as best I could based on their feedback, that's when I ship it off to the professional editor for developmental edits, copy edits all that stuff, the stuff where you're like, I'm feeling really confident about my writing. And then you hire someone and pay them a lot of money to tell you that you suck. Oh, and you're yeah. like, <laughs> take my money, thank you. Take my money and abuse me. Right, <laughs> I'm gonna go cry for a week <laughs> and then wipe away my tears and <laughs> fix everything. <laughs> so that's the next step. And then, uh, yeah, and then it's on to publication. <laughs> Absolutely. and. Um... So the alpha stage for you is really that, that critique partner stage, essentially. Mm -hmm. And right. what does and also, that look like? Well, I have a handful of critique partners. I usually try to have at around two or three. Um, and also the very first person who quote unquote reads my book is my fiance, Cliff. Uh, the thing is, is that um, he, uh, <laughs> he is disabled. Um, he has a chronic pain condition, which makes it harder for him to concentrate mm. um, when he reads. So I read it out loud to him, which is kind of two birds with one stone because I get his opinion and also uh, 
it's the self-editing process of reading it out loud because when you read out loud you hear all the mistakes and so sometimes I'll be reading it out loud to him and it's an early draft and I'll just have to stop mid-paragraph and be like I'm sorry Cliff I need to fix this this is all messed up I'll get back to you you know um, but yeah it's he's the first person who hears I guess everything that I write um, then I send it out uh, once I have about like 10 chapters that I feel like are cleaned up I start shooting it out to my critique partners and they're kind of like mini editors they leave comments in the margins and it's cute because they'll tell me what I'm doing wrong but they'll also like you know they they ship my couple to Blayla they'll be like oh my gosh they're kissing and they freak out and it's adorable so it's like it's both positive reinforcement and also wow this sentence is horrible fix it you know so it's it's a fun process at least I think so sure sorry the reason I was just laughing my butt off was because I do exactly the same thing with Demetrius my husband oh, really? who only has one eye so reading for long periods of time is really exhausting for him so I sit and I read out my book to him and again I find exactly the same thing every now and then I'll be like I'm so sorry I just just give me a minute and I have to just like fix it <laughs> I'm like how how that. did somebody the same person sat down three times in this paragraph how is that po how many butt cheeks does this guy have do you know what I mean <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's happened so many times. And it's it was helpful for me, especially with writing The Savior's Champion, because it is a male MC and I am female. Uh, and so at, at least initially, after a while, I was like, OK, have some confidence in yourself. But at least initially, I would like pause every page and be like, Cliff, is this something a guy would say? And he's like, yes, he's like, you live with a guy, you know, you're fine, you know. But uh, yeah, it's, it was re it was reassuring. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And having somebody like that very trusted, it doesn't have to be a partner, it might be your mum, it might be your best friend. Having somebody like that that you can, um, again, I don't know why I keep going back to Stephen King today, but Stephen King says write with the door closed and then write for that one person and let them in. Um, I don't even like the book that much, but for some reason apparently it's on my mind today, so who knows? Uh <laughs> But um, yeah, having somebody that you can read aloud to is so valuable. And it's interesting that both of us have found that. And I think a lot of other people find this as well. It's something I've heard a lot. You know, listen to it being read electronically or read it aloud, aloud yourself and you will you will hear mistakes. God damn it, mm -hmm. you'll hear them. And then you can fix yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, reading it out loud is a pivotal process. I cannot skip it. Even uh, when I first started doing that, it was because I, you know, like with my very first novel, it was because I was feeling insecure and it, it helped to have the reassurance of, okay, I can send this to betas, right? Like, it's a good enough, right? And now at a point, it's just, I'm at a point where it's just uh, fun for me to read it to him and I notice my mistakes and it helps me out. So, yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a like I said, two birds, one stone. <laughs> nice. So we've talked a lot about writing, we've talked about drafting, we've talked about plotting, but of course we at World Anvil, we are a community of hundreds of thousands of world builders. At what stage do you start world building? Like, does it get developed and refined in multiple stages? Does it, is it, do you front load it and then write the book? How does it work? Um, I, usually recommend and again it depends on the person but I usually recommend that create the story the the basics the main points of your story and your main characters first and then add the details around it including the world and the reason that I say that is because when people are picking up a book they are there for the story they are there for the story first and foremost they read the back of the blurb and that's why they're, they're the back of the book blurb and that's why they're there the back of the book blurb doesn't usually isn't usually just here's a deep description of the world the world kind of nestles the story in it's like the little basket the story is sitting in so i say personally i start with the main concept of the story the main concept of the characters and then the main concepts of the world for example in the savior series like the most basic generic idea of the world is it is slightly grecian roman and latin american inspired so like that would be the first building block think of it kind of like a tree you start with a stump and then you add branches <laughs> the the uh, more generic details and then that's when you can start adding the little the leaves and details um, in terms of adding the, those details, for me, a bulk of that happens during outlining um, when it comes to the world, uh, because as I'm outlining, as I'm creating the story, as my characters are traveling or as they're, um, you know, we're, 
seeing where they live or their home or things like that, that's when I start needing those details in the outline. Like, okay, now we're in their home. What's the home made of? All that sort of good stuff. And then um, I would say at that point, the world, at least the world that we're seeing in that story will be about 75% created. And then as I'm writing the story, you know, even when you outline, there are going to be things you don't take into account. And then as you're writing the story, it's like, oh crap, I did not think about this at all. What, where are we going to add these finer details? So I kind of do it in stages. I know some people like to sit and I, I've talked to people who are like, I spent nine years building this world. And then I'm like, okay, I, I couldn't do that because I got to, I got to start writing that story, you know, but some people, they like to sit and just build a total world and then create a story for it. For me, it's, you know, it comes in stages and I feel like everything has to support one another because at the end of the day, if you create a world and you don't have a story that works in it, then what's the point? At, at least what's the point if you're a writer and, you're, right, absolutely. and you want to write a story? Absolutely. Yeah. World building without purpose is world builder's disease. We have a term for it. We have an official diagnosis here at World Anvil. It is called world builder's disease. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, if you're just pure world building because you love world building, you could still get world builder's disease. We've covered that in previous podcasts, so you can go back and check that out. But uh, particularly if you want to write a book and you spend nine years world building, you have a problem that needs to be addressed. <laughs> that book is not coming out quickly. Uh <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but you're right. Yeah, I'm like, uh, people will tell me that. And I'm like, okay, but the book, like it went out, if it took you nine years to build the world, how long is it going to take you to write the book? You don't even have a story yet. You're just very infatuated with the world. And then you know that a lot of the facets they built in those nine years are not going to ever be relevant. And it's kind of, I mean, like, it's still fun. There are so many facets of, you know, Thessin, the world in uh, the Savior series. There are so many facets that I know will never become relevant in the story, uh, but it's fun for me and I enjoy building it, but it didn't, I didn't spend nine years on it. You know what I mean? Like, right, exactly. uh, it, it, you know, I allocated my time. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Barry Saxe in the chat says, I want my elven shoes, which is a <laughs> reference to the fact that, you know, if you create the elves, fine. They got to wear something, so you make clothes, all fine. If you find yourself writing a brief history of elven footwear for the last two, two centuries and it's not relevant for your book, it's not a major plot point, you have world builder's disease. You need to see somebody about this. Uh, so that's that's the, the, the common one that I always use. It's, it's the elven shoe syndrome, right? Um, so uh, what are, and again, we've already mentioned one, what are common mistakes that you see writers make in their world building, apart from just, you know, getting stuck and never writing that book? The biggest mistake uh, for me as a reader when I'm reading books is when the writer is like, I've built this beautiful world. Let me just dump it on you um, in a massive prologue or even if they're like, I'm being sneaky and I'm gonna, it's not in the prologue, but half of chapter one is world building. Half of chapter two is world building. Half of the, every chapter is world building. You. I know that a lot of people like they think of Lord of the Rings and they're like, oh my gosh, that's, I love that world. I want to recreate that. And I, I completely understand, but at the same time, you have to remember that that was a book written a really long time ago. Publishing standards change, uh, reader expectation changes, storytelling practices change. And you can love a particular book. Um, you can love a particular author. Like, for example, you can love Jane Austen, but still recognize that publishing a book written in Jane Austen style now, it would be a hard sell. Um, so my biggest advice with world building is it's great if you've created a world that you love, but nine times out of 10, if it's not relevant to that particular scene or situation, the reader is not going to care. It is just going to come across as filler and it's going to be boring. So dump the world in pieces as your character is traveling through it. So if instead of giving this big long exposition dump about the climate of your world, have show your character trudging through snow. And then that kind of tells the reader that it's a snowy climate like hello they can put two and two together and also um something to keep in mind at least for me as a reader not only do i find these big long exposition dumps boring but it's also a bit of an insult to the reader's intelligence because it's assuming that they're not smart enough 
to put the context clues together. Like if you're trudging through snow, then I can tell that this is the kind of place that snows. I live in California, it doesn't snow here. So I already know that it's not gonna be the climate I live in. I can figure that out on my own. But um, if you then go on with a page waxing poetic about the climate, I'm gonna be like, do you think I'm dumb? Like, you think I couldn't figure that out based on what you told me? I, I could figure it out. So um, as much as you may want to just dump a ton of description about the world in your story, refrain, resist, <laughs> let so, the reader figure it out. So I guess, um, and what I love there is that you've given us a little bit of a, a solution there as well. Basically, so expo dumps, we've talked about them before on this podcast. They're a big problem and... Um, Again, one of the reasons that World Anvil is so useful is that you can do the expo dump in World Anvil, and then pull out the salient <laughs> details for the novel. And then you still have exactly. all that world building saved somewhere, and and then you can use it in bits and pieces. What are some other ways that you can sort of show rather than telling world building, which is, I think, what we're talking about here, right? It's about delivering it in a shown way rather than a told mm -hmm. way. Exactly. I, I, th I think it's literally... Think about the word show, think about visuals. Um, so for example, instead of giving a big long dump about this is what elven shoes are like, you know, and the history of their shoes, you just describe what the character is wearing. That immediately gives them an idea of what the, the, the clothing is one of my favorite world building pieces because it immediately um, lets the reader know about their culture. It lets them know, it can let them know about gender norms. It can let them know so many things. Are the women all wearing dresses? Are they wearing pants? Are, are the men wearing kilts? I mean, like it, it, it can show so much information just by saying, describing what a character's outfit is. So I look at it as go into a new scene when you're entering a new room or situation, what do what does your character see? Describe that. What do they see that is brand new to them? Describe that in detail because that's the stuff that they're really going to be taking in because they're not familiar with it. What are they seeing that they are so used to it's not a big deal? That's the stuff you're going to skimp on the detail because it's not quite as important to them. If, uh, For example, if a character is speaking a language they haven't heard of, that might be something where you're describing how the language sounds. If they're speaking the language they the character speaks, you're not going to have a ton of description about that because that's that's their normal language. It is just, you know, day in the life. Yeah. Um, another thing I would recommend is using your five senses. Um, that is something I think about every time I set the scene. Think about what you're seeing, what the character's tasting. I know that sounds really weird, but if they just got out of a fight, they're probably tasting sweat and blood, or they might be tasting the remnants of smoke. Um, uh, what they're smelling. Smell can totally set the scene and describe a world really easily. If it's humid, it might smell kind of thick and swampy. You know, if it, if, if they're in a really scary situation or a gross situation, maybe they're smell, uh, maybe they're smelling something gross that I wouldn't want to describe, <laughs> you know? Uh, and if, if they're like, if you're trying to set a romantic scene or this is like a, you know, like a beautiful bedroom with silk pillows and there's a beautiful woman in a jeweled bra or something like that, maybe they're smelling perfume and incense, you know, you just think about all of your senses and that will create a much more visceral experience for the reader while also building the world and making them feel transported as opposed to making them feel like they're reading a history textbook, you know, make them feel like they're in the world versus yeah. I'm at school learning about it. Right, absolutely. Um, I think the other thing that, that I love to do, um, and I'm sure that this is something that you do and have talked about, but um, it's, it's just something that I have found very, very useful when talking about exposition, is putting things in motion with powerful verbs. So yep. I am much more interested if you describe something that rockets across the room than that is sitting on a table. I exactly. want to know about the thing that is rocketing across the room in front of my eyes. I want to know about the, the person that is talking to me in this. Not that I read a language that is static, but somebody talks to me in a language. So giving, putting world building in motion always makes your world feel more alive and more mm -hmm. vivid, but it also gives you a chance to use active verbs and it gives your um, your protagonist a chance to react as well, essentially. Exactly. To it. 
Exactly. And active verbs in general, it's just going to benefit your writing. I'm always telling people, like, if you're writing a fight scene, don't do the technical fight choreography terms. Use words like blast, slam, thrust. I mean, that could be used in other scenes as well. But, but you know, use those powerful verbs because that will make them feel like they're there seeing the fight firsthand or feeling the blows, you know. So just powerful verbs in general. I'm always like, if you can find a verb that fits the scene and and really transports the reader that's what you want to go with so, yeah I agree yeah so we've talked about writing we've talked about world building um time is ticking on you are of course an expert in self-publishing as well you have a degree in a background in in finance business and, yeah, and and business finance, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. what's the number one piece of advice? And I, I'd love to have you back just to talk about this, but, uh, <laughs> we're kind of, kind of doing a bus tour of everything Jenna today. So <laughs> I wanted to sort of touch on everything. Um, what's the number one piece of advice you would share with anyone who is considering self-publishing that is, has not already self-published, but is, is thinking about going that route? Um, I have two pieces of advice only because I could, can't decide which one's more. They're both. Yeah. So the first one is, and this is for anyone, if they go self-pub or traditional, understand that it's a business. At the end of the day, yes, you are an artist. You are creating art. You're creating a world. That is fine. But you, if you're going to sell that art, as in selling books, it's a business. So you need to adopt a mentality of this is half art, half business. And you need to educate yourself on it. Um, educate yourself on the publishing landscape. Educate yourself on both self-publishing and traditional publishing so you can be aware of industry standards. Um, I basically, while I was writing my debut novel, I uh, spent maybe a year or two focused at, while I was at work and supposed to be working. Um, I was focused on learning about publishing. So I would be at work, you know, like Googling uh, publishing articles and reading books about self-publishing and things like that. So it, it's not something that you, I, I wouldn't recommend writing the book and be like, okay, I'm going to self-publish. Now what? You should be figuring this out along the way. Also understand that the industry changes. So sometimes you will learn something about the industry and then the, you know, whole rules change and you have to learn it again you have to learn a whole new process so uh, it's a it's constantly evolving the learning never ends I learn new things every single day um, so talk to lots of authors get lots of opinions you know interview people network and understand the business side of things or else it's going to be a really really rough ride my other piece of advice is hire a professional editor just do it just hire someone you will be so glad you did um, and you will kick yourself if you don't. Good, very good piece of advice. Um, I have read a lot of self-published books. Um, overwhelmingly, not all of them, but overwhelmingly, they have had editorial problems in the first couple of pages that could easily have been mm -hmm. solved just mm -hmm. with a good editor. Any tips on finding a good editor? Because uh, there's a lot of people out there who say they are editors. There's a lot of yeah. self-published authors who proudly say, I hired an editor, here's my book. And I look at it and I go, oh no. Right. Oh no, you spend money on somebody to, to edit this and they have not done a good job. Um, um, I have a couple videos about this, um, <clears throat> but uh, I the number one thing is, first of all, talk to your friends. Um, talk to other authors you know, get references from people, and not just people you know, but people whose work you've read and you thought it was well edited and nice. you liked it, okay? Um, because there's a lot of people that I've known who they'll be like, oh yeah, I'm an editor and I like the person, but I know I know you're not a professional editor. I know that you're just an elementary school teacher and no, that's not hating on elementary school teachers, but that's not, that's not credentials for being a professional fiction editor. Um, so talk to people, um, get references, and then vet them. And I mean, thoroughly. And so go to their website. First of all, if they don't have a professional looking web website, that's already probably not a good idea. Um, compare their rates to other people. If their rates are astronomically higher, it, they could be um, fronting as, oh, I'm charging a premium for a basic service. Um, if their rates are significantly lower, it might be because, hey, I, I, I'm a scammer and I'm just trying to get whatever, you know, uh, customers I can. Um, also look at their credentials if they have them available. Um, editors require training and background um, just like 
all other professional jobs. Um, so something like I said, like being an elementary school teacher or a high school teacher, that's that that's great, but that's not uh, training for being an editor. Um, you know, uh, proofreading an essay, correcting an essay is not the same thing as um, editing a fiction manuscript. It's just not. Um, if that was the case, I could be an editor because I'm great at proofreading essays, you know, but no, I can't because I don't have the proper training. Um, and then one thing a lot of people forget to do is most editors have a list of some of their past work on their website. Um, if they don't, that is really sketchy and should be a red flag. If they've got a list, those books are available on Amazon. Pull up the teaser and read them. If you find mistakes right in the first few pages, that's a bad sign. It could be, it could be that the uh, author, because just because you hire an editor doesn't mean you have to input their feedback. So it could be that the author said, I like it the way it is and I'm keeping it. It's possible. But if it's typos and grammar errors and things like that, the odds are that the editor isn't very good. So, I mean, I know this sounds like a really long process, but take the time because if you end up paying someone to edit your book and they do a bad job, that's potentially thousands of dollars you're out. So this is, I would highly, highly suggest taking the time to vet these people thoroughly and see their past work and what they have to offer. Fantastic. And, um, what I'm trying to trying to read my own questions and I'm struggling terribly. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Lord knows what's happening here. I beg your pardon. Um, uh, what are the most common mistakes you see amongst self-published authors? Um, number one, not hiring an editor. That's right. probably the biggest mistake yeah. I see. And I I understand it's expensive. Editors are crazy expensive. But number one it's a really boring job. It's a really tedious job. They have to trudge through your crap and fix it. That's not fun. So I personally think they're getting paid what they're worth because they're they, a proper editor can will can and will make or break the success of your book. So not hiring an editor, um, doing your own cover art, unless you are skilled in graphic art. Some people are, if you're skilled, I guess have at it. But um, a lot of people aren't, and they think I'll just go to Canva and make it myself. And we can tell, we can tell you made it yourself. And if readers are going to think if you didn't take the time to like get a professional cover, what's the inside of the book look like? Because the cover is the first thing people see. It's your biggest marketing tool. And if you, you know, have asked that, then going into the book, they're going to think it's it's going to be more of the same. A lot of you know second tier work. Um, also, like I mentioned before, not really understanding the business. There's a lot of I wrote a book, I put it on Amazon. How come no one's buying it? And it's like, well, did you market it? No, was I supposed to? Did you build an author platform? No, was I supposed to? Did you develop an audience? Is that something I'm supposed to do? I thought I just put my book on Amazon and people buy it. That's never going to happen. There are millions of books available for sale all over the place. What are the odds that people are going to randomly stumble upon yours, a book they've never heard of by someone, an author they've never heard of, and they say, you know what, I'm going to part with my hard earned cash and buy this book on a whim that I randomly stumbled upon that is written by someone I have no idea if they're any good at it, but whatever, I'll just give it a shot. It's not gonna happen. So you need to start early building an author platform. You need to start early trying to accumulate an audience. And that way you have someone to sell the book to, people who are invested in you and your writing. So those are the biggest mistakes I see. And I mean, these things can literally just, it'll be the difference between zero sales and thousands of sales. So do, the, yeah. do these things. <laughs> yeah. Going back to uh, why editors are expensive, I just wanted to add that it is hours and hours and days and days of their time. Novels mm -hmm. are big. If they're doing mm -hmm. their job properly, it's going to take them time to actually read through carefully and make sure that they are editing it properly. So that is the right. other reason um, mm -hmm. that editors and are expensive. Just want to throw that in there. 
And people love to think, but my book is special. My book is so good that this is an honor for them. And it's like, you're hiring an editor because your book is not good enough right now to be published. They're reading, you know, a not so great version of your story. So don't think that you're special and that your book is just an honor for them to read. It, they do this all the time. It, your book has mistakes in it. It's not fun to read it in this state. So don't think you're doing them any favors. They are for sure doing you the favor. That's the entire point is yeah. so that you can, they can make your book good enough to sell it where people can enjoy it. And just uh, the other thing, and actually this is this leads to a question to you as well, is there are different kinds of editors. There are copy editors, mm -hmm. there are de developmental editors. Do you use developmental editors or do you go straight to the copy editor stage? I, it, it depends on the project, um, but more often than not, I do use a developmental editor and more often than not, I think that skipping that step is a mistake and I wouldn't recommend it, especially if, like if you're writing something that's a bit simpler, for example, a contemporary romance, that sort of setup in a story is going to be a lot simpler. And I don't say that as a negative thing. There's nothing wrong with contemporary romance, but it's a little bit easier to write in that formula than it is high fantasy, for example, or science fiction, for example, because in those stories, you are building an entire world. You, it could be 30 plus characters. There's going to be lots of subplots. There might be traveling. Whereas with the contemporary romance, it may be a woman who runs a flower shop and, you know, the mailman. And it's, it's a little bit more compact, uh, a, an easier formula to follow. You might not need a developmental editor in that case. But for people who use World Anvil, they are most likely building a world they are most likely writing in a more genre specific way like science fiction or fantasy or uh, post-apocalyptic or something like that nine times out of ten you are probably going to need a developmental editor um i usually uh for me the the line edit either is part of the developmental edit or the copy edit um so i usually end up having to hire two editors so it's either a developmental and line edit bundle and a copy edit or a developmental edit and then a line edit, copy edit bundle. Um, fortunately for me, I'm a bit of a grammar buff and I'm very anal about grammar and punctuation and things like that. So usually by the time I get to the copy edit phase, it looks a little bit more like proofread. It's not a ton of work to do. But even with that said, I would not recommend most people skip the copy edit either because not everyone is anal about commas like I am. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like a lot of people, they really, you know, don't understand that stuff. Let someone help you because it's really, really uncomfortable reading a book that's filled with grammar errors. It'll yeah. completely suck you out of the story. So I wouldn't skip a copy edit either. Yeah, no, I mean, hard agree. There's nothing more distracting than, um, thinking that you're you're reading a book and then suddenly thinking feeling like you need to get out your red pen and start circling stuff because it's wrong and now you're not focusing right. on the story anymore right right and it, it, it completely takes you out of the story and it also um it reminds you it's fake that a flawed human being wrote this and we're all flawed but we don't want the reader to remember it while they're reading you know so just do yourself a favor hire a copy editor and and i always recommend learn from the editor they're there to tell you what you're doing wrong if you don't understand what they're saying ask them to explain and learn from it so that you don't make those mistakes again in the future use this as a process to improve your writing uh, it, and it will save you money on your next book because there's going to be less work to be done. A lot of people hire an editor. They're like, fix it. Okay, I'm done. Good to go. Don't, don't look at it like that. Like learn from it so that in the future you can save yourself some dollar bills. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic piece of advice. All right, folks, I think it's time to jump to some audience questions. And my goodness, there's a lot of them. Fantastic. <laughs> nice job, guys. We will get through everything that we can and hopefully... Hopefully one day Jenna will come back and talk to us again and uh, and ask us some more questions. She seems amenable, people. Let it be remembered. <laughs> All right. Our first question is from Melu Plays, who says, I'm writing sci-fi and I know some of the tropes of the genre, but not all of them. Should I research more to apply them on my novel or write without focusing so much on them? I always recommend reading while you write, um, but I personally recommend uh, reading a multitude of genres because the more genres that you are well versed in, the more you can make your work uh, stand out. And I'm not saying that should be your goal, like to be hyper original, because sometimes people, when people are so focused on uniqueness, it just it, 
it doesn't work out. Things can go wrong. Um, yeah, exactly. So, but I, I would recommend reading as many genres as possible, um, getting yourself well versed in all different types of styles. Um, I think it's impossible to know all of the tropes in your genre. I mean, I, I love fantasy, I love sci-fi, and I know I don't know all the tropes because there are thousands. There are so many tropes. A trope is basically anything that is common within storytelling and everything that we see in stories has is, is been done before. It's everything is a trope. So I wouldn't worry too much about not knowing all sci-fi tropes because that is a high hill to climb and you're never gonna reach the top. I would just I would just focus on reading, absorbing what you can and don't set that high of a goal because the you're ne I mean, I don't mean this in a mean way, but you're never gonna know all the sci-fi tropes because there's probably thousands out there. Right, exactly. It's like spending nine years world building. It's it's at the end <laughs> of the day, it's more of a distraction than it is a help. Um mm -hmm. I would also add that there are so many different genres of sci-fi. So sci-fi mm -hmm. is a big old genre with a lot of subgenres. Like fantasy is a genre, but Harry Potter is not Twilight, is not I don't know. I'm struggling now. Yeah, exactly, Lord <laughs> of the Rings. Um, yeah. So, like, there's a lot of different... Sp it's not Game of Thrones. There we are. Um, uh -huh. There's a lot of different subgenres. There's a lot of spaces to go. So you'll you'll never be able to read everything and know everything. At the end of the day, there has to be a moment when you just say, I'm writing this book. Right. And I, and I also think that it's great to include... Include the tropes you love. Don't just include them because this is a sci-fi trope, so I'm going to include it. Include the ones you love. There are plenty of fantasy tropes that are not in the Savior series because they're not the fantasy tropes that I'm interested in reading about, you know? Um, and th there are tropes you want to avoid because they have become cliche. So it, it, just write the tropes that you love and you like to read because if you like to read it, someone else does too. Yeah, and don't worry so much because there'll be tropes in there that you didn't even know you wrote. Right. That's that's how it goes. You read right. it again and you're like, huh, I really felt like this old lady had to die. And now I realize that I just killed a mentor. But I already realized that in draft three. <laughs> Looks like I accidentally troped. Uh, right. <laughs> it happens, people. Uh, fantastic <laughs> question here from Cocktail Hour. Nice. Who asks, <laughs> when world building, how do you manage the reader's suspension of disbelief? Do you distract them with bits of realism? Do you thoroughly research science to make it speculatively realistic? Or do you rely on the reader's genre expectations? Good question. Oh my gosh, that is a really good question. Can I say all of the above? I mean, it it's, it's one of those things where it really depends on the moment. It depends on the scene. I mean, there are so, some things where it's like, yes, this is unrealistic, but it's fantasy. We expect dragons. That's going to happen, you know, like a flying lizard. It, if you think about it, that is kind of unrealistic but you expect it in the genre so it's okay it's fine it's magic guys you know if all else fails fall back on magic um but then there are a lot of situations where you just need to make it work within the science and confines of the world you've created so um yeah it it, it it also depends on uh, the, the time frame that you're writing it in. If this is, for example, urban fantasy, so it's in our world, it's gonna, you, you can rely on magic and unrealistic things, but certain elements of it will need to make sense within this world. For example, if it's this world and no one has access to a cell phone, no one's gonna believe that. But on the flip side, if we're writing in Thessin, which is sort of an ancient type world and they have cell phones, no one's going to believe that either. So you have to think of it within the confines of the world and what scientifically would make sense within the world. And you also have to understand when to abandon science because who cares? It's magic or who cares? It's the future. It's alien alien technology. It's, it's kind of a judgment call. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Exactly. And the, the one, the only thing I would add to that is foreshadow, foreshadow, foreshadow. Whatever it is, mm -hmm. if it's plot important, foreshadow it otherwise people are going to think mm -hmm. you pulled it out of your butt um <laughs> i love that <laughs> tillers asks what made you start writing i've wanted to be a writer since i was six i remember the exact moment uh in the first grade every, once a week it was either every monday or every friday we would write books on like construction paper and we would bind them with construction paper and I love the whole process. Um, my very first book was about, it was called The Funeral and it was about a dead cat. 
So that just kind of foreshadows everything wrong with me and, <laughs> and why I write about decapitations and things like that. Um, it was all very clear from a young age. My teacher was frightened. Um, but yeah, the, I, from that point forward, I had wa originally wanted to be an author and illustrator. Um, I used to be very involved in art. Surprise, surprise, the main character of my book is an artist. But um, I used to be very involved in art. And But after a certain point in my life, um, I was pursuing both things side by side. And then it got to a point where um, I realized that my passion was for writing and art it was art was becoming too stressful like trying to make it perfect um it stopped being for me and start started being more for like the awards i was winning and things like that so i ended i ended up putting art to the side and focusing exclusively on writing but pretty much it's it's what i wanted to do since i was a little kid i was uh particularly inspired by uh, the adventure movies and things like that, that I watched as a kid. Most girls my age really love Disney princesses. Uh, my dad had me hooked on Clash of the Titans, The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, Jason and the Argonauts, uh, The Mysterious Island, The Time Machine, those kind of movies. Um, I, those are still my favorite movies. And uh, I've always wanted to write stories like that, you know, an epic adventure with a hero and a heroine who you know, fall in love and battle bad guys. That's, it's, nothing's changed since I was six. I am a mature adult. I love to hear that <laughs> because for me, it was Indiana Jones. Uh, oh, I, that, that's up there too. I love Indiana Jones. Oh my gosh. My that's, parents, that's on the list as well. My parents are both archaeologists. I have no idea how they let me watch Indiana Jones, which is <laughs> like, you know, as an archaeologist, it's just complete nonsense. But oh my God, yeah. Right. <laughs> also the Goonies. I loved the Goonies growing oh, up. Oh, Demetrius so that... is such a fan. My God. Yes. So that was on there too. And that's how you end up bringing up children that write uh, epic fantasy genre <laughs> yeah. fiction. My parents were like, oh no, what have we done? We should have just <laughs> had her watch The Little Mermaid over and over again. <laughs> uh, Cora Snow says, what's the best piece of advice you can offer for recovering from lost motivation? Um, no one's going to like this, but it's what I tell people all the time. Just, just write, just do the work. It's kind of like, um, I mean, and, and I'm coming at this from a, a viewpoint of this is writing is my job. It's my passion. And I feel very, very fortunate to do this for a living because it's what I've wanted my whole life. But at the end of the day, it's still my job and, um, it still pays the bills. And if I don't write the books, um, I'm going to become homeless and live in a cardboard box and I'm, I'm not going to be able to pay my bills or buy groceries. Um, and you look at it, if you want to make writing a career, you have to kind of look at it with that mindset. Some days we go into work and we are not motivated to be there. We do not want to be sitting at that desk or in that cubicle, but we go because if we don't, we're not going to make our money or we're going to get fired and lose our job. You have to think about writing in that way, which sounds very dismal, but it's just kind of a necessary part of the process. As much as you love writing, like I said, it's my absolute passion. There are going to be days where you are not motivated. You do not feel like doing it. And you're just going to have to suck it up and put on your big girl panties and do it anyway. And honestly, if you do that enough times, it, it may not, the motivation might not come back that, that day or that week. But if you suck it up and keep writing, it will come back. You will remember, you will get sucked into your story and you will remember your love for it and why you're writing it in the first place. And if that never comes, if you have been slaving on this story for weeks and you are just miserable, that's a good time to stop and assess why are you writing it? Do you still believe in this particular story? Maybe your tastes have changed. You know, we evolve and change. You know, we, we our preferences change. Sometimes we get into writing and realize it's not really for us. So if weeks and weeks go by and you are just not enjoying your writing at all, it might be time to stop and think about why that is and figure it out. Yeah, great, great advice. Incidentally, this week on Sunday, which is, my God, tomorrow, uh, we will be going live with our second summer camp homework prep, and we will be talking about curated inspiration boards. So this is a tool that you can use to refine the inspiration from a project if you find that it's getting a little bit stale. Um, and I have some steps for you on how to create a curated inspiration board. So it's not overwhelming, but it's very, very targeted. So uh, if you would like to learn more about that, just tune in tomorrow at seven o'clock uk time and 11 a.m pacific time which would make it 2 p.m eastern time i suppose and um yeah yeah i'll tell you about curated inspiration boards and how to keep yourself engaged 
that reminds me, another thing to keep in mind is um, figure out what your um, specific like inspirational trigger is. For me, it's music. Every mm -hmm. time I listen to music, it's music I like specifically, I get ideas for my stories. So for example, um, I'm working on the third book in the Savior series right now. And it's been after a long break of not writing because I was getting the Savior Sister ready for publication. Now I'm starting this book and it's been a long break and I feel totally out of the writing groove because I haven't written in months. So what have I been doing every single day? I've been listening to my writing playlist and it's been getting me all excited and amped to write it's been giving me so many different ideas for me that is my inspiration trigger I listen to these songs and I see the characters in my head I see them battling I see them making out and all that stuff and I get really really excited to write again so if you can find something that just gets you in the zone like that you know cling to it hang yeah. on to it you use it when you need it yeah absolutely and try different things until you find something that works mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of questions one from Sharon Beatty one from uh, Sable Radia. Uh, about how to find beta readers, how to find critique groups that will tackle novels as opposed to short stories, how to set up critique partners, all of these kinds of questions, where to find people to help you with stuff, essentially. So <laughs> social media, uh, network, 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 all of my beta, I mean, at this point in time, it's easy for me to find beta readers because I have a large platform. But um, when I first got started, I would just post on Facebook, will anyone read my book, this is what it's about. Um, I just need feedback. And a lot of people like to read. So you'd be surprised how many people will respond, but you got to make it sound appealing. Okay. A lot of, I see a lot of people saying, will someone better read my book? And then that's it. No, I don't know what it's about. You know, say, say I'm looking for people to read my book and offer feedback on whether or not they liked it. This is what it's about. We've got dungeons and we've got princesses and we've got explosions, you know, like let let people know that it's going to be an exciting read. It may not, they may end up disliking it, but you know, sell it, um, get people interested and just put it all over social media. This is also why it's so important to start building an author platform, because if you are just, if you have like five followers on Twitter and you post on Twitter, um, please beta read my book. You're just shouting into the void. No one's going to hear you. So mingle, follow writing hashtags, join writing groups. I mean, I'm sure you could find beta readers on World Anvil. Like that seems like, you know, like a very obvious place to be able to find people because everyone here is building worlds and a lot of them are writers. Um, I have my own writing group on Patreon called Cyborg Central. We have an entire channel devoted to finding beta readers and another channel devoted to finding critique partners. So people will join just to go to those channels and be like, I need a critique partner help. There are like 700 people in the group. So there's going to be someone, someone's going to be interested. So join writing groups, get on social media and be loud and annoying until people sign up. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of author platforms, we had a question from the squishy squid, one of my favorite usernames. Uh, how do you build an audience when you don't have a book yet or for your first book and on which platforms? Um, that, okay, I'm going to try and be concise. Um, it completely depends. A lot of people think you can't build an audience until after you have a book available. Um, the best time to start building an audience is before you've got a book. Um, the way you do it is first mingling and networking with the writing community as a whole, make yourself known, meet other writers, because guess who likes to read? writers. So if you mingle with the community and build a network, you are potentially building a readership. Um, then it, if you look like, for example, at my platform, I chose YouTube because to be frank, a lot of people told me I'd be good at it. They're like, you have the personality for it. I'm an introvert like most writers. It was not my first choice. I did not want to put my face on the internet, but I tried it out because uh, I heard I'd be good at it. And now I have 213,000 subscribers. So Clearly someone was right. Uh, you, you test out the different platforms based on what you think you'd be good at, what other people think you'd be good at, what you're personally comfortable with. Um, I say that with a, a, a little hesitation because um, I was not comfortable with YouTube. Sometimes you have to risk it for the biscuit. Um, but what I mean comfortable with is by that, I mean, um, if you try it and you're doing it for a while and it just doesn't sit right with you, you're not enjoying it, then try something new. Um, and then in terms of what to say and how to acquire that audience, uh, keep in mind that 
this is gonna sound mean, but whatever. People are inherently selfish. They are on the internet looking for something for themselves to enjoy, something to help themselves. Um, you are here on World Anvil because you want to build a world. Uh, that's that's why you're here. It's it's for you. That's not a bad thing, but that's something you need to keep in mind when you build this platform. People are, if, for example, if you go to YouTube, people are not on YouTube thinking, what potential writer can I help today? They're there for their own entertainment. So you need to offer something. You need to provide some kind of service, whether it's entertainment value, whether it's advice, something that people are looking for, a reason for them to come to your platform. For me, it was writing advice. Uh, not everyone is comfortable with that. That's fine. You can do book reviews that you could, you know, do world building like with World Anvil. There's so many different things you could do, but you just need to provide something to get people interested in you. Once they become interested in you and they are there, they start to become interested in you as a person. And that's when you can start being like, hey guys, by the way, my name is Jenna Moresi and I am a writer and this is what I'm working on. Uh, but you need to offer something for them first or else they're not going to have any interest in your platform. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, content marketing 101, something that keeps you mm -hmm. interested. By the way, here's a tool that will help you. Or by the way, if you want to learn more, read my book where I actually do this on that kind of thing, basically. Exactly. And I just cannot emphasize that enough because I see so many people creating their author platform and maybe they're on YouTube or they do a blog and the very first post is about me and about my book. And it's like, this is your first post. No one knows who you are. No one cares yet. You have to provide something for them. Right. So start with that. What can I do for other people? Fantastic piece of advice. Chlorophoba asks, as an American white male, how do I write for characters of another race, gender, ethnic background? I guess we can add species, everything else in there as well, <laughs> depending on the genre that you're writing. Um, great question. Yeah, this is a fantastic question. Uh, my first, the first piece of advice I always give is recognize that people are people. Um, people tend to have this thought process that our brains are wildly different if, you know, between a woman and a man or someone who is a person of color or someone who is white, our brains are just like completely different. It's like, we're a whole different species. Keep in mind that we are a lot more alike than we probably think. Um, and a lot, especially when it comes to gender, a lot of the differences um, are more societal expectation. For example, um, it is considered societally appropriate for women to cry. Whereas if a man cries, he's probably gonna be told to man up. Men don't cry that, you know, but men still feel like crying sometimes. Men still get sad. It's not like they are incapable of experiencing emotion. So a lot of the differences between people are more societal expectation than anything else. That doesn't mean there aren't differences, you know, but just keep in mind that a lot of it is expectation. So yes, maybe you're, for example, you're a white man, maybe you're writing a woman. Um, just just because she's a woman doesn't mean she should be crying on every page. She think, you know, she it, it just means that if she decides to cry or she feels like crying, it would probably be considered okay according to society. Um, the other thing I would always suggest is recruit beta readers and sensitivity readers who represent the people that you are writing. Okay, especially outside, especially if you're a, a white man or a cisgendered straight white man. I would definitely suggest recruiting beta readers and sensitivity readers that's not to say like if you're a cisgender straight white woman don't don't recruit them i recruit them um get their feedback um because sometimes you will do your best and you still write something that's inaccurate or offensive get the feedback um, and listen actually listen to what they're saying don't get defensive and be like well it's my book you know like listen to them they're your readership they know what they're talking about yeah, absolutely. And remember that um, I, I loved your example, um, you know, straight white men don't cry. Um, yeah. That is true in America. That is not true right. everywhere in the world. It is true in Britain. Nobody shows any emotion mm. whatsoever. We all look like this all the time. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> sorry, podcast listeners, you cannot see my weird chicken faces. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's not true everywhere. And remember that... It, if you're here, I'm assuming that you're writing fantasy or sci-fi, you are building the cultures. So look right. at the norms for different 
racial groups, different cultural right. groups, different uh, gender groups in your world and look at those norms and then decide when somebody is crossing a boundary within those. Because That's actually, okay. you're creating the whole mm -hmm. space. You can do whatever exactly. you want, as long as your readers and buy it. Uh, that's something like with uh, Thessin, the, the world in the Savior series, um, I made it a more sexually fluid society. So for example, in the US, if a woman has lots of sex, someone might slut shame her. That's not really gonna be a thing in Thessin because sure. they are a more sexually fluid society and they it's not, that's judging someone based on their sexual activity is not really a thing. It might be a thing in other realms in that world, but not within Thessin. So those are also definitely, I 100% agree with you. Those are things to keep into consideration. You're building this culture. You have the power to make it however you want. So um, just because men don't cry or are you know, frowned upon for crying in the US doesn't mean that's gonna be the case in your world. Right, exactly. And uh, I think probably our final question for today from David Corkett, very good, very good question. What do you think is the most important aspect in your world building for your books? For me, it's the most important and my favorite, and this is my favorite as a reader as well, is culture. Um, the, you know, the clothing, the holidays, the religion, that kind of stuff. For me, that's what really makes a world shine and stand out is what it is, the culture, their customs. Um, you know, for example, like um, in the Savior's uh, Champion, there are things called royal drapes. They're kind of like togas, um, but different and um, they have a color symbolism so each color represents something different those are the things that I live for when I'm reading I like the bits of culture I don't care so much about what the trees look like or the climate or the like uh, architecture specifically I want to know how these people interact what you know the gender expectations are things like that that that's oh I love that stuff <laughs> fantastic fantastic so it's all about that sort of human experience or or right elf experience or sapient species <laughs> experience shall we say exactly exactly I, I live for that fantastic lots of people shouting about sensitivity readers use them they are very valuable if you are writing the other whoever the other is and uh it's very easy to um make assumptions or not explain things properly or various other things just just find a beta reader who's a sensitivity reader if there's somebody who you're not doing a favor for, like you're reading their book as well, then uh, make sure you pay them. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, good stuff. Basically. They're all they're all over the place. And even if you think you are the most well-adjusted, open-minded person, you you may not be. You, you can still make mistakes. It's human nature to make mistakes. Hire these people so they can help you make less mistakes. So, exactly. Um, and and the real question is not what you meant, but how it is interpreted on the page. And that's exactly. that's the thing. You never know that because you are in your own head. Somebody asked, mm -hmm. is there a, is there a downside to editing your own work, even if you are a trained editor? Um, and I would say that's that's the downside. You don't see your own mistakes in any forum. Right. You don't see them or they'd be gone already. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, it, it You need a, a fresh pair of eyes, someone who is not emotionally invested in the work. You need you need a different person. And it, but if you're an editor, you must have a lot of editor friends. So <laughs> talk to them. Get, but you, you do need someone who is not emotionally invested in it because, oh, man. But once that other person comes in and tells you, you know, you use this word like 50 times. You're like, oh my gosh, how did I not notice? You didn't notice because it's your book, because yeah. you you are too into it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Jenna, I have one final question for you. What are you working on now and what can we expect to see next? Uh, well, right now I am working on getting the Savior Sister all ready to go. It comes out in September, September 29th, I think. Here I am like forgetting my own book's release date. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's September 29th. So um, I've got a massive pre-sale giveaway going on. So if anyone wants to pre-order uh, TSS, there's also a uh, pre-sale giveaway entry form you can enter in. And I'm handing out over 35 prizes constantly. Um, so you can check my channel, youtube.com slash Jenna Moresi for details all about that. Um, so that's what I'm working on in terms of my writing. I am working on the third book in the series, which its name I cannot yet reveal because <gasps> it is spoil yeah, it is spoilery toward the Savior Sister. So, um, but yes, that one is in the works and I'm very excited to be back into writing. <laughs> Very, very cool. Well, Janet, thank you so very much for coming to hang out with us today and sharing your expertise. 
Thank you. It was an honor and a privilege. Oh, well, um, I, we were just thrilled to have you here. There's been so much hype. The chat has been full of, oh my God, Janet and Jenna in the same stream. Oh, I love that. That's well, so cute. Guys, you are such sweet beans. Thank you all for hanging out with us today. Thank you for everyone who threw bits. I heard them come in, who got subscriptions, who followed us. We go live. If you're new to this channel, we go live five times a week. We do webinars about World Anvil. We have amazing guests like Jenna, Brian McClellan, Chris Fox come on and talk about writing and how to do it and how to market your books and all that good stuff. And if you have requests for guests or topics to cover on this podcast, then you can just shoot us a message at World Anvil on any social media that exists and we're probably there and we'll probably answer you we'll do our best mm -hmm. um evan Arix says question can we have her again what do you say uh, jenna do you want to come back and talk to us again i i would love to i would absolutely love to yes i am Count me in. thrilled maybe when we are closer to the savior's champion release date we can have you back sure. sorry the savior's Sounds sister release date yeah. <laughs> i we saw your face know. i was like wait what did my brain do <laughs> It said something. <laughs> well, I got it close enough. <laughs> okay. I did, well, it in my, I did it in my own video. It's like the pre-sale for the Savior's Champion is coming up. And I had to add a little disclaimer. Like, I meant the Savior's Sister. It's my own book. <laughs> <laughs> so easy to do. Oh, man. Making videos is hard, people. <laughs> it's true. All right, folks. Well, you can catch us tomorrow at seven o'clock where we will be talking about inspiration boards, curated inspiration boards, how to stay inspired with a project and not get new project excitement syndrome, which yeah, we've all been there. We see those exciting yeah. bunnies of new projects. We want to chase after them, but no, we must finish things. We must make <laughs> our time worth it. So we'll be talking about that tomorrow. Um, I imagine that we are going on a raid. What do you say, Demetrius? Are we going on a raid? <laughs> I would imagine that we are. Uh, let's just find out. Sorry. Our usual moderator is not with us today. So we are... Um, we're we're, we're, we're uh, vamping a little bit. It's kind of what I'm, kind of what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Doing some vamping. Love it. Lots and lots of excitement in the chat that uh, you will be coming back, Jenna. That's fantastic. Yay! Um, I don't think we're going on a raid because I don't think any of us we being friends are live right now. I think everybody's taking Saturday off, which is completely reasonable. I guess we should be doing <laughs> that too. So my beautiful beans, if you would like to check out World Anvil, you can go to worldanvil.com. If you would like to check out Jenna, you can check out any of those links that I have shared one more time in the chat because Jenna is fantastic and we love her and uh yeah you should go read her book and uh we will be with you next week for another one of these in the meantime grab your hammer and go world build bye bye <laughs>